Greetings. We will begin unit 4 today. Uh, this will be on the many electron uh, systems. We did the hydrogen atom, the non relativistic hydrogen atom first, and then the relativistic hydrogen atom. We did the Dirac uh, formalism of the hydrogen atom as well. And we were very fortunate in dealing with this because the one electron Coulomb problem has exact solutions and we got the exact solutions for the hydrogen atom, both for the non relativistic case as well as the relativistic case. So, atoms in general other than the hydrogen atom, they have more than one electrons and 2, 3, 4 and so on and you have got the whole periodic table. So, we need to develop the quantum mechanics of many electron systems and this is really important because atoms in a certain sense are the basic building blocks of condensed matter. So, when atoms come together you have molecules, clusters and condensed matter. So, in some general sense you can even say that uh, the atom is like what elementary particle is you know somewhat similar in a certain sense that uh, it is the elementary ingredient of condensed matter. So, all properties of condensed matter are derived from the properties of atoms and from their collective behavior. And we need to understand that when you have more than one electron present, then these electrons are going to interact with each other and we will talk about electron interactions with each other and also electron correlations. And I will make a distinction between interactions and correlations. This difference will become clear as the discussion progresses, as cor correlations has got a specific connotation, which will become very clear. And in particular, I will talk about two different kinds of correlations, one which are known as exchange correlations and another kind of correlations which are known as Coulomb correlations. So, we will talk about both of these in this unit. So, these are our primary learning goals and we will approach this from first principles as much as possible. And we will be extending the quantum mechanics which was developed you know by Einstein, Schrodinger, Heisenberg and applied to atom atomic systems by Niels Bohr. And then when it comes to the many electron formalism, we will talk about the work of uh, Hartree and uh, Vladimir Fock. So, this is our goal for this unit. I will be using Betty and Jacques uh, intermediate quantum mechanics rather extensively for uh, this unit. Uh, it is a book which many of you would have uh, used for basic quantum mechanics. I will also use uh, Branstein Joshin's book Physics of Atoms and Molecules and there is a small review on the Hartree Fock method which I had written with two of my colleagues which is uploaded at the course uh, web page which also you can access where some of the key features would be sum summarized. Now, this is the relationship that we have to address. So, we will first work with the non relativistic many electron problem and the Schrodinger equation will read h psi equal to e psi for the n particle system, n being the number of electrons that we have in the system. So far so good, but immediately we meet new difficulties. And what are these new difficulties? What these new difficulties do is to create a situation which can perhaps be called as a catch 22 situation. And do you understand what catch 22 means? Okay. Catch 22 actually this is this phrase comes from a novel by Joseph Heller and it made so much impact on the English language that it actually became accepted in the English language as a regular phrase. What it means is that you have a situation 
which has got some internal inconsistency. Okay? You can describe the situation, uh, you can seek to solve that situation, to address that situation and find some sort of solution, but the solution becomes impossible to be implemented because of some internal constraint which is intrinsic to the system. It is a very fascinating novel and actually the situation in this uh, novel is, uh, is about an air force pilot who does not want to go into hazardous uh, you know, uh, duties and he wants to escape from it and he discovers that he can escape from it on one ground that if he is not psychologically fit, mentally fit to execute, then he will be relieved. So, there was such a provision. So, he applies, you know, he asks to be relieved under that situation and then they say that, okay, if he is sane enough to say that he wants relief because of this reason, then obviously, he is not mentally sick. So, it is a provision which is inbuilt into the situation, right? And this is the catch 22. So, there is a catch and the many electron problem, you know, poses itself as a catch and I will tell you what the catch is. So, let us look at the n electron Schrodinger equation. Now, you set up the Hamiltonian for the n electron problem, which is the sum of the kinetic energy part. Okay? I have not written the mass, which is in natural units put m equal to 1, h cross equal to 1. Okay? So, this is the kinetic energy term okay? and then this is the potential energy of each electron in the field of the nucleus. There are z protons in the nucleus. So, each electron would experience an attractive potential, which is z over r and you would sum over i going from 1 through n. And then each electron would repel the other electron. So, between the ith and the jth electron, there would be a the 1 over r i j coulomb repulsion. And you must sum over all the i and j, i naught equal to j, right. So, this is the coulomb repulsion of every between every pair of electrons. So, this is your n electron Hamiltonian. Now, look at the system. If you have electrons in the atom, so you have got the z protons in the nucleus and then you have got this 1 over r i j term, which is between the i th and the j th electron between every pair. Now, this is the distance between the i th and the j th electron. Okay? Now, the problem is that electrons are not classical particles. Okay, so, they are not like point charges and you can cannot say that okay, this is where the ith electron is located, this is where the jth electron is located and this is the distance between them. Now, that is how you would describe the classical coulomb interaction between two classical charges. Now, the electrons are not like that. Electrons are described by waves in quantum mechanics. So, they have a certain wave function associated with each electron which is the probability amplitude function as we know. right? Corresponding to this probability amplitude, there is a probability density and this multiplied by the charge density is what would give you the charge at a in a per certain volume. So, if you got a certain volume element over here delta v and in this delta v, you find out what is the probability density integrated over the volume that will give you the charge over here and then this charge would interact with the corresponding charge over here, which is also to be described in terms of the probability density over here. And then these two charges would interact with each other giving you the 1 over r i j term. Now, that is precisely the catch, because to describe the charge density over here, do not you need the wave function for the electron? You do. right? And how are you hoping to get this wave function? by solving the Schrodinger equation. Okay? So, you set up the Hamiltonian, right? solve the Schrodinger equation and hope that okay, I will now get the wave function and use this wave function to describe the probability amplitude, the probability de density and the charge density, but you need the solution even to pose the problem. Okay? That is the catch 22. 
So, you are caught up in a situation that you need the Hamiltonian to get the wave function, but to constitute the Hamiltonian to formulate the Hamiltonian you need the wave function. Okay? And this is a vicious circle and if you do not know how to deal with it, easiest thing to do is to quit physics and walk out or else come up with some very nice innovative ideas. Okay? And this is where self consistency comes in. What you can do is, okay, I do not know the wave function and therefore, I cannot construct the Hamiltonian. So, let me make an assumption on the wave function. I will make a guess, does not matter if it is wrong, let me make a guess. And using this guess wave function, I kick start the process. Using this guess, I construct the Hamiltonian. Now, using this Hamiltonian, which is based on a guessed wave function. I now solve the Schrodinger equation and get the solution and now I ask is this solution the same as what I had guessed. If it was I got lucky, if not no problem I will change my guess. Okay? And then reconstruct the Hamiltonian with a new guessed wave function then solve the Schrodinger equation and then ask is the new solution the same as my improved guess. It could actually be worse, but it could be better and you iterate on this process again and again and again and again till you hit self consistency. Okay? Now, that is the trick. And once you get this self consistency, you can then say that now you know what the Hamiltonian is and you know now you know what the wave function is and you get the two together when you reach self consistency and then use that wave function to describe other properties of the atom and then do spectroscopy with these atoms or electron structure analysis, collisions and so on. So, these solutions can be obtained numerically by carrying out this iterative process and this was a technique which was developed by Hartree, D R Hartree at Cambridge and uh, initially Hartree did not take into account the electron spin, but then there is the spin which we know has to be taken into account and then the formalism of self consistency which was developed inclusive of the electron spin is what we call the Hartree Fock formalism, that is something to which Vladimir Fock contributed significantly. So, that is the overall technique of Hartree Fock, and I will um, is essentially the, uh, the difficulty is summarized on this slide that setting of the Hamiltonian itself requires the very same solutions which you hope to obtain by solving the Schrodinger equation. So, that is the difficulty that you are now going to address. So, this is our many electron Hamiltonian, this has got a formal structure okay? and the summation over the Coulomb repulsion terms can be written either as this or half of this double summation uh, with i and j going from 1 through n, but i not equal to j. So, these two you know ways of writing this Coulomb repulsion is completely equivalent as you probably know. And this has got a part which consists of only one electron coordinates and in this term you have got two electron coordinates. So, this is usually called as the one electron Hamiltonian and this term as the two electron Hamiltonian and sometimes it is referred to as H 1 and H 2 and sometimes as F and G, but that is just a matter of notation okay, depending on which book you will be reading. So, this is the n electron Hamiltonian and now we are going to seek a solution and of course, we will be happy if we can get an exact solution. And this problem was posed to Poincare by the king of England, a uh, king of Sweden. If the three body classical system 
the sun, earth and moon, does it have exact solutions. And even in classical mechanics, it does not have an exact solution. That is what leads to chaos and other things, right. You now, when it gets down to quantum mechanics and relativistic quantum mechanics, let alone three body problem, not even a two body problem, not even a one body problem or for that matter even the problem of a vacuum state does not really have ex exact solution. Okay. It just does not, the solution does not exist. And this is very nicely stated in Brown's book, where he says that if you are looking for an exact solution, then having no body at all is already too many. So, there is no chance of getting an exact solution. Okay. So, now what are you going to do? Try to come up with the best approximation that you can. And if you can make a come up with a good approximation, then it is going to be a breakthrough and that is how science progresses. Okay. So, the Hartree-Fock method is not going to give you an exact solution to the n body problem, to the n electron problem, but it will give you an extremely good approximation extremely good again this is a relative, relative term it really depends on what application you have in mind what is extremely good at one level turns out to be completely unsatisfactory at another level and then you have to go beyond the hartree fock okay so current studies in atomic physics do require you to go beyond the hartree fock and i will tell you what are the limitations of hartree fock and what is it that you need to go beyond the hartree fock but before we get to talk about it, let us just make, let us at least make ourselves comfortable with the Hartree Fock itself. So, now there is a nice remark that I came across in Herman and Skillman's book on um, approximate Hartree Fock solutions, in which they write that let alone the fact that you cannot get exact solutions, but suppose you did. Okay. If even if you could, how much space would it need to write down such a solution? Okay, how much ink would you need? How much storage space would you, would you need? Okay, and just consider this problem: that if you have n electrons and each is described just by three parameters, three degrees of freedom, right? Then you have three n variables. Okay, which you must specify and you want to specify what is the electron wave function amplitude over here and then here and then here and here at least at 10 points you need if not infinite right so a 10 point grid would be a very coarse grid nobody is going to be satisfied with that but you will need 10 to the 3 n numbers right and what is 10 to the 3 n for n equal to 1 or n equal to 10, mercury atom 80 electrons. Can you punch this and find out from your calculators what this number is? 10 to the 3 n for n equal to 80. And where are you going to write the, all this information? Who is going to generate the ink for it and where is the storage space for it? Okay. So, there has you have to have you know some way of dealing with this problem in some practical manner and the hartree fock method really lets you do that. So, in addition to that of course, you have got the electron spin which we know and uh, the history of the development of Hartree's method is really very fascinating. I think it is worth reading. Uh, this was a differential analyzer which was designed by Hartree in 1935 and Hartree played a big role in the development of computers. Uh, initially, he was uh, interested in the anti-craft gunnery, that was his initial interest. But then there was, uh, he also used uh, children's mechano, I do not know how many of you have played with it. And uh, with these uh, mechano, which are toys, uh, you could actually do some calculations and uh, Hartree was inventive enough to be able to use it and do some actual calculations in atomic physics. But then uh, there was a lecture course by Niels Bohr 
at Cambridge and that uh, got Hartree interested in atomic physics and then he started using his brains uh, to come up with this uh, formalism. And then uh, he was helped by his uh, father who was an engineering professor, but he thought it was fun to do arithmetic. And uh, he helped his son uh, do all this numerical uh, work to get what we now call as Hartree's self consistent field method. So, a large number of computations had to be done and the, this was obviously in the pre computer days. And um, in fact, uh, the first uh, computer as you know is the ENIAC and when this was uh, developed Hartree was invited uh, to advise because unless there is somebody to use a good machine, you cannot really develop a good machine. So, you know all major computer companies IBMs and so on they do hire atomic physicists even today. Uh, so, that they can develop their computers. So, uh, Hartree was one of the first ones of this kind and uh, Hartree said in 46 that it may well be that the high speed digital computer will have as great an influence on civilization as the advent of nuclear power and we do know how true it is. So, uh, Hartree certainly made a very important contribution to the development of uh, computers as well. And uh, now, uh, we, we discuss this problem further. This is the self consistency that we are seeking as I mentioned earlier. You have got the n electron Hamiltonian which is made up of two parts, the one electron part H 1 and the two electron part H 2. Okay? So, these are the two parts of the Hamiltonian and the Coulomb term 1 over r i j is the electron part. Now, what is going to be our strategy? And this comes from our experience in physics. The variational methods are very powerful. Okay? You build the machinery of classical mechanics on the variational principle. Newton's causality principle is one pillar on which you can build classical mechanics, but you can also do so based on Hamilton's variational principle right? and build the entire scheme of mechanics. You also know you use the variational principle to explain uh, how light travels the Fermat's principle and so on. So, using the variational principle you can set up a requirement that the variation in the expectation value of the Hamiltonian would be an extrema. Okay. What wave function would make the expectation value of the Hamiltonian an extrema? If you make this question, if you raise this question and find such a function, then one could hope that this would be the appropriate self consistent field solution to the problem. So, this is a variational approach and this is our strategy now, which is to seek that the expectation value of the Hamiltonian is an extremum. We certainly know how this works, because it does not necessarily mean that okay, it will be a minimum, because when you study only the first derivatives, you could have a minimum, you could also have a maximum, you could also have a saddle point. right? So, there are all kinds of possibilities that one has to worry about and yes, these things are properly kept track of and we can get into these details as the discussion progresses. But this is the basic strategy that the variation in the average value, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian you seek that this would be an extremum, but when you vary these wave functions, okay, you have got some wave function, it has got some profile and you change it. So, instead of a certain profile, it becomes somewhat different, right? That is variation, you have changed it. Now, when you change it, you have to make sure that the new shape that the wave function would acquire under the variation that you are trying still generates a normalized wave function, right? Because if you integrate the probability density from 0 through infinity over the entire space, you should still get one charge per electron. 
you would also expect this to be orthogonal to the remaining atomic orbitals, right. So, these are the constraints. So, you are seeking variation, but not arbitrary variation, a variation which will preserve the normalization of each one electron wave function and also its orthogonality to the other single electron wave function. So, these are the constraints and your problem is now posed as a problem in variational calculus. So, to get this variation in the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, this is the expectation value of a certain operator which is the n electron Hamiltonian, but the n electron Hamiltonian is made up of two pieces, the one electron part and the two electron part f and g or h 1 and h 2, okay, however you call them. Right? And you need to determine the expectation value of these two operators, the one electron operator and the two electron operator and then seek a variation. So, so we first have to learn how you are going to develop a, a formal structure of this term, which is expectation value of this one electron operator and the two electron operator. So, the, this is going to be the first step in you know making progress on this problem. So, Hartree and uh, the son Hartree and the dad Hartree, they developed the self consistent field for um, electrons, but did not take into account the electron spin from the first principles. And then Fock included the spin as well. And I would like to remind all of you once again that spin is something which Ullenbeck and Goudsmith, you know, hit upon accidentally when they were interpreting certain experimental results in Pasteur's laboratory and because they saw some transitions which seemed to be forbidden. And then to explain those spectra, they made a guess and they said that okay, there has to be an additional source of angular momentum, an additional source of magnetic moment and it just worked, but that is it, it, it worked for no good reason as was known at the time, but then we know that the reason is the formal existence of electron spin as it comes out of Dirac's relativistic quantum mechanics. Okay. So, so spin is uh, an integral property of the electron and then uh, Pauli uh, developed the spin statistics theorem that particles with half integer spins observe the Fermi Dirac statistics and particles with integer spins observe the Bose Einstein statistics. So, spin um, is an integral property of electrons and it has to be taken into account as we know from relativistic quantum mechanics and these are the two classic papers in 1928 by Dirac in which he developed the relativistic quantum mechanics which gave a formal basis to the idea of electron spin. And it is interesting to ask this question, how does statistics, because now we are going to talk about many electron systems and electrons are fermions. So, we will apply the Fermi Dirac statistics. So, how does statistics enter quantum mechanics at all? How does it enter classical mechanics and how does it enter quantum mechanics? So, in classical mechanics, basic laws of motion are deterministic you know the initial conditions, you can actually determine what the solution is. And you can do it for one particle, you can do it for 10, you can do it for 100, you can do it for 1000. Okay. That you may not need that much information is a different matter. Because when you want to talk about the average energy of some system, then you know that each degree of freedom will contribute half k t to the average energy. right? But this is the average kinetic energy, which you describe in terms of temperature and it is coming from the kinetic energy, the half m v square kind of term, which gets added into what finally gives you the temperature of a system. right? But it is not that you cannot determine that, average, that, that kinetic energy of each individual molecule, you can, in principle you can. You do not need to, because it is too much information 
in which you are not interested. And that is how statistics enters classical mechanics, because you are dealing with a large number of particles and you really do not need all that information. It is not because you cannot get that information, you can, you do not need, these are two different situations altogether. In quantum mechanics, statistics, statistics enters even for a single particle. Okay, and even for vacuum, okay, because laws of nature are intrinsically quantum mechanical and they are statistical, okay, because quantum mechanics is a statistical theory. So, it is not because there is a large number of particles that you are working with, even for a single particle you need statistics and then statistics enters also through the spin of the particle. Okay, because depending on what the spin is, you have to use a different form of statistics. If the spin is half integer, you would use Fermi Dirac. If the spin is integer, you would use the Bose Einstein. So, statistics and spin are very closely related and I will discuss this further. So, let me first deal with a two electron system. Okay. You interchange these two electrons. So, there is one electron at coordinate q 1, the other at q 2 and I is the interchange operator, it swaps them. Okay. The interchange operator swaps them. So, you begin with a two electron system, apply the interchange operator okay, and now you apply the interchange operator on this again, swap it one more time, you get this, you get what you started out with. right? So, two interchanges I operating on psi q 1 q 2 and then another interchange operator operating on the result would regenerate the original system that you began with. Now, these two electrons are completely identical to each other. Okay, you cannot distinguish between them. And that is the main difference between classical particles and quantum particles. When you deal with classical particles, you can sort of put a color on them or a number or some name and you can say that this is particle A, this is a particle B. But that is not how particles in nature really are. Elementary particles are indistinguishable from each other. Okay. You cannot really put a label on that. And this is why this two electron wave function is sometimes called as a geminal. Do you know what a geminal is? Ge you know what Gemini is? Have you seen the Gemini constellation in the sky? Okay. It is a beautiful part of the sky. Okay. And there are two lovely stars, Castor and Pollux, in this constellation, and they look so alike, so similar to each other that they look like identical twins, okay? which is why this is called as Gemini. So, Gemini refers to twins, and these two electrons that we are talking about, psi q 1 q 2, these two electrons are completely identical to each other, they are completely indistinguishable from each other. Castor and Pollux actually you can distinguish between them, okay, one is Castor, the other is Pollux. You can't do so with electrons, but they are indistinguishable just like twins, okay, which is why a two electron wave function is sometimes called as a geminal not a very common usage, but not uncommon either. So, you have a two electron system, you interchange twice, you recover the original configuration. What this means is that a single interchange can only change the phase and it can give you a result when you interchange q 1 with q 2 by a single interchange operator, 
the result can be either plus or minus, because when you interchange it one more time, it will be the same as the previous one. Okay? So, this is what we have got, that two interchanges e to the i 2 alpha would give you 1. So, e to the i alpha would be plus 1 or minus 1, and accordingly this angle will be either 0 or pi. Right? So, there are two types of particles in nature, one are the fermions, which have got half integer spins whose wave function would change sign under the interchange of two identical fermions. But if you interchange two identical bosons, the wave function will remain invariant, the sign will not change. Now, this is, there is this intimate relationship between spin, statistics and the sign of the wave function on interchange. These three things are intimately connected to each other. Okay, they all go together, the spin being half integer or integer goes with the statistics that the particles would observe, and this goes with what would happen to the sign of the wave function under the interchange of two particles belonging to the system. These three things go hand in hand together. Now, I quote from Tomonaga's book, in which he points out that relation between spin and statistics is apparent, but hard to understand. And an even more comprehensive quote, which some of you might have come across, is due to perhaps one of the finest of physics teachers, Richard Feynman, and he says in his volume 3 that it appears to be one of the few places in physics, where there is a rule, which can be stated very simply, but for which no one has found a very simple and easy explanation. The explanation is down deep in relativistic quantum mechanics. You can say very simply that, okay, if the particles are half integer spins, they observe Fermi Dirac statistics, if they are integer spins, they observe both Einstein statistics. But to get to the bottom of this issue, why this? Okay. One really needs to get into relativistic quantum mechanics in a fairly comprehensive way, and uh, that, that uh, is a challenging topic by itself, but uh, I will recommend uh, Tomanaga's book for this, The Theory of Spin. It is a very nice uh, book, some of you might have come across, or if you have not, you will enjoy reading it. So, anyhow, we have we, we accept that this is what it is, and under one interchange, electrons being fermions, the sign would change. Okay. And now, we talk about a two electron system. The two electron system is the smallest many electron system, and if we can develop a formalism for two electrons, we will know how to extend it to many electrons. So, we begin with the consideration of the smallest many electron system, namely the two electron system. And we write the two electron germinal wave function psi q 1 q 2, which we know must change its sign when you interchange the two particles. Okay. And an obvious way of doing it would be to write it as a product of these one particle wave functions u 1 q 1 u 2 q 2 minus u 1 q 2 u 2 q 1. Okay. Because if you interchange q 1 and q 2, this changes sign. So, it is it meets our essential requirement of an anti-symmetric wave function, that is what an anti-symmetric wave function means. Fermi, Fermi Dirac wave functions are anti-symmetric, because when you interchange particles, this sign changes. So, this is an antisymmetric two electron wave function, and it is written in terms of the one electron wave function, and I have written this one electron wave function more fully, because the wave function is the coordinate representation of the state vector. Okay. So, this is the coordinate representation of the state vector, 
in the Dirac notation which the wave function is. Okay. The state vector is described by a complete set of measurable physical properties, the four good quantum numbers which are n, l, m l and m s for the electron and its coordinate representation gives you the one electron wave function. This is inclusive of spin and there are therefore, four quantum numbers. Okay. Now, if you look at the de Broglie Schrodinger notation, the u i q j, notice that the subscript here i represents the set of four quantum numbers and the argument of the wave function which is q j represents the set of four degrees of freedom, the three space variables and one spin variable. Okay. So, the arguments q j are a set of these four coordinates and the subscripts are the four good quantum numbers. Okay, that is the notation. Now, it is important to recognize that we are treating the two electrons as indistinguishable. So, you cannot separate one from the other, but the particles are still elementary particles. So, this is a very nice combination of ideas. The elementary nature of the electron is not challenged here in this concept, okay. but you cannot distinguish one from the other, because normally when you talk about an elementary particle, you talk about the particle as though it has got a complete separate identity, which is the fundamental identity of a fundamental particle. Right, But that identity is lost when you are dealing with a pair of electrons, because you cannot say that this is electron A and the other is electron B. So, where is the identity? So, this is the combination of these two ideas indistinguishability and the electrons being elementary particles. And you have to use these two ideas without any contradiction in your mind. Okay. So, the electrons will be treated as elementary particles, but they will be considered indistinguishable from all the other electrons in the system. And this is our representation uh, of the electron uh, coordinates and quantum numbers. You can write this easily as a determinant u 1 q 1 u 2 q 2 minus u 1 q 2 u 2 q 1. right? And if each of these one electron wave functions is normalized, then you can see very easily that you will have a normalization 1 over root 2. Okay? So, you can easily write this as a determinant and in this determinant, the rows and columns, columns are labeled by q 1 the first column, the second column by q 2 and these are the coordinates. Okay. The rows are labeled by the subscripts, this is subscript 1, this is subscript 2. Okay. So, the rows correspond to the set of four quantum numbers, which are the occupied states of the electrons. So, this is called as the Slater determinant named after John Slater. And you will see that the Pauli's exclusion principle is automatically built into it, because a determinant vanishes if two rows or two columns are the same. right? So, no two particles will have the same set of quantum numbers, which is Pauli's exclusion principle. The antisymmetry of the wave function is also inbuilt into this representation, because if you interchange two rows, the sign of the determinant will change. right? So, it automatically takes into account the usual features of a many electron wave function. And you can easily extend this not just to two electrons, but to n electrons and then you have got you know uh, n rows and n columns and a normalization of 1 over root factorial n. So, this is a, a straightforward extension from a two electron system to an n electron system. You can try to 
develop a determinant for a three electron function, do it by hand, term by term, okay, you will find that there are factorial three ways of doing it, six ways of you know putting three electrons in three different systems, right. So, um, the rows are designated by the one electron state. So, the electron configuration is spelled out and this also spells out the occupancy of single particle states. That if you have got you know an energy spectrum in which there are you know hundreds or even an infinite set of you know uh, single particle orbitals which are solutions to the problem, not all of them are occupied. So, if you have got a two electron system like the helium atom, you can have two electrons in the one s state, one with one s up and one s down, but you can also have one electron in the one s and the other to some excited state like two s, three s, four s and so on. right? So, that will give you a different configuration. So, the first configuration had two electrons in one s. So, the occupation number of 1 s up was 1, 1 s down was also 1 and the occupation number of everything else was 0. Whereas, if you have one el electron in 1 s and the other in 2 s, then the occupation number of 2 s now becomes 1 and the rest becomes 0. So, the occupation numbers and this is the language of second quantization, which also you know one uses in many electron theory in second quantization you deal with the occupation number states and you can see how the Slater determinant expression can easily be adapted to the occupation number formalism. So, essentially what the Slater determinant does is to spell out the occupancy of the single particle states and uh, it incorporates the usual features of a many electron system, the Pauli exclusion principle, the antisymmetry of the wave function. These are our designations and you can write the spin orbital, this is called as a spin orbital, this is the orbital part and this is the spin part and which is why it is called as the spin orbital, okay? because you can factor this spin orbital u i q j into an orbital part and the spin part. Okay? So, this is the spin part and this is the orbital part. So, the u i q j are typically called as spin orbitals and the matrix elements of the Slater determinant are essentially the spin orbitals, in which the columns are those which give, which correspond to the coordinates and the rows correspond to the single particle states, which are occupied and each spin orbital then is a measure of the probability amplitude that an electron at space spin coordinate q j is in the quantum state n l m l m s corresponding to the i th row. Okay. So, that is the notation that is the designation of the states and uh, this is how a Slater determinant is written. Uh, you are of course aware that there are factorial n ways of permuting the n indistinguishable electrons in n quantum states. So, you can also write this as a, you, you, you can write all the elements along the diagonal u 1, q 1, u 2, q 2, u n, q n and then begin permutations okay? and carry out all the permutations, but every time you permute, every time there is one interchange you will have a change of sign. Okay, so, depending on the number of interchanges which go into a permutation, you will have a minus 1 to the power p phase factor and you must sum over all the permutations and there are factorial n of them. So, you have to sum over all the permutations for p going from 1 through factorial n. So, you can write the Slater determinant equivalently also in this notation. It is the same as the Slater determinant right? and this operator in this box is sometimes called as an antisymmetrizer, because what it does is to take this direct product of the diagonal elements and antisymmetrizes it. Okay? So, this is sometimes called as an antisymmetrizer. So, um, this is the antisymmetrizer operator, I will um, stop here for this class and we will begin from this point in the next class. 
questions. How did we exactly separate the uh, the spin orbital and the and the space part? Yeah. The okay, the spin orbit coupling does give you a net angle of momentum, but these are distinguishable properties, like how you define angle of momentum. When I said that angular momentum must be defined in such a way that when it is subjected to rotations, it follows a certain law okay? and it is not going to follow that law, if you do not subject the orbital angular momentum and the spin angular momentum together. Okay? This is what we did in unit 2. So, these are two separate sources of angular momenta, they are completely independent of each other okay? and they have though their eigenfunctions. One is an eigenfunction of L square L z, the other is an eigenfunction of S square and S z and together they give you L plus S equal to j and both the eigenfunctions of L and S must be simultaneously subjected to a, a rotation. So, the separation comes from the fact that these are two independent sources of angular momentum. We have, an, uh, we have a non-zero L dot S term, then, then, uh, then that, that, that does not matter that you have a non-zero L dot S term, okay, I, I understand your question, like S orbitals. Okay, S orbitals have got L equal to 0 and J will go from 0 minus half modulus to 0 plus half modulus. So, there is only one state which is available. Okay. Now, that is only the eigenvalue of L square, okay. but that does not prevent the electron from having the property of orbital angular momentum. It has a property of orbital angular momentum and it is in one of the states corresponding to L equal to 0, but it is an independent property which is completely independent of the spin. So, these are two independent sources of angular momenta J 1 and J 2 which couple to give you J 3 or the net J which is L plus S equal to J and their respective eigenfunctions are the spin part and the orbital part. The net wave function is a product of these two. Any other question? Okay, so, uh, let me um, stop here and we will uh, resume for from this point tomorrow. <coughs>